The Louisiana Book Festival enjoyed its sixth year in downtown Baton Rouge, representing over 100 authors. Join us for Louisiana Book Talks as we celebrate our rich literary culture with highlights from the 2008 Louisiana Book Festival, featuring author Michael Gates Gill. Book lovers of all ages enjoy the variety of activities offered at the Louisiana Book Festival. Between the Capitol Building and the State Library, the festival is packed with booths housing everything from storytellers to basic printmaking skills and cartoon artists to specialty publishers. In the State Capitol, authors read from their latest works, often providing personal insight to their writing. In this edition of Book Talks, we'll hear the amazing story of author Michael Gates Gill. The son of New Yorker writer Brendan Gill, Michael lived a life of wealth and luxury. For 25 years, he served as the creative director of J. Walter Thompson Advertising Company. His recently published book is titled, How Starbucks Saved My Life, A Son of Privilege Learns to Live Like Everyone Else. I'm very grateful to be in this beautiful chamber today to, to speak with you and, and share with you. And I'm also grateful because uh, one of the shocks I experienced in my life was being diagnosed with a brain tumor. And I think that sort of, in a sense, wakes you up to how precious and and, and blessed every second is, really. So I feel grateful just to be here, just to be, uh, in a sense, talking and walking, let alone in such a beautiful place uh, at, at a great time. And uh, that shock, by the way, I took it as so unfair because, you know, a series of things just happened to me when I was in my fifth, started in my 50s, and, you know, you reach a certain point in your life where you're sort of saying, now I'm just on downward glide. I don't want anything bad to happen. I was given virtually everything to start with. I grew up in a very fortunate, uh, privileged circumstances. Uh, my father, Brendan Gill, was a famous writer at the New Yorker magazine, and a magazine before the uh, internet, uh, before even any decent TV shows. Uh, the New Yorker magazine was something people in the literary world, and actually readers all across the world, really looked forward to every week. Because every week there'd be a new writer like J.D. Salinger first appeared there, or Truman Capote first wrote there, and, and James Thurber, who invented the Walter Mitty idea, and, and E.B. White, uh, who did you know, Charlotte's Web, and Stuart Little, and, and these were also, they were brought, my father brought these figures home, and E.B. White, I just reread re -read Charlotte's Web the other day, by the way, and it was really a beautiful book about uh, life and death, in a sense, although it's called a children's book, it has so many wonderful passages. E.B. White himself endeared himself to me because he was rather diminutive, rather small and uh, white-haired, and he seemed like a little mouse. He'd written a book called Stuart Little about a mouse. And I grew up in a big house, 25-room house, mansion, but I felt like a little mouse in this big house. So I felt a uh, rapport with E.B. White, and then Charles Adams was a cartoonist at The New Yorker, who was a very genial fellow, but he invented this very scary family I loved called the Adams Family. He would be amazed. He would be amazed that it's still a popular TV, you know, rerun shows. And, but at that time, it was sort of like, I grew up in all this, and then later in life, I knew Jackie Kennedy, and uh, Ernest Hemingway scared me into doing a stupid thing. By the way, I wouldn't necessarily any, any, recommend anyone live my life, but I think Hopefully today, many of you can learn some lessons of what not to do in your life. Uh, don't ever run in front of the bulls in Pamplona, you know? <laughs> I knew all these great figures. I was given a Yale education. In those days, by the way, you could be given a Yale. There was no nasty stuff about tests. I mean, uh, my admissions interview, uh, they didn't ask one word about my marks, which were mediocre, or SATs, which, you know, not discussed. It was like, uh, how do I spell your great uncle's name, you know, in the class of 1896, you know. And then he got up from his desk and the admissions person walked around. I think I'd had about 17 ancestors or father, grandfather, that kind of thing had gone there. And he said, you have to go to Yale. And that was the world that I inhabited, which is, it was a gift that, and in a sense, both a gift and a have to. You know, that combination of all these privileges, but all these expectations. And then after Yale, I was given a job, just like I've been given so much. A friend of mine called and said, you know, you should join uh, J. Walter Thompson, which was then the largest advertising agency in the world, and it was owned by uh, a Yale man. 
And by the way, when I say owned, it wasn't a stock or anything. It was like Henry Luce owned the Time Magazine and this uh, Stanley Resor owned J. Waddle Thompson. So I was given a job without any job application. So you can see the momentum I felt. And you know, the sad thing was I felt I deserved it. I mean, all of us did in this little cocoon. We look around at J. Waddle Thompson, mainly uh, Yale guys, maybe a Harvard person or something. We'd say, boy, you're great. They say, no, you're great. You know, we all looked alike, so we thought we were great. Uh, we didn't really understand that we had been given it. We were thought we, were, we really were the masters of the universe. And uh, then for me, uh, it began to fall apart when I, I was 53 and I was invited out for breakfast off-site. And by the way, anyone in corporate life, here's another piece of advice. Don't go for that meal. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like the mafia. You know, it's your last meal because I was invited out and they fired me. And it was really in advertising and probably in other professions, you know, as you get old, you get more vulnerable because you've been promoted up and you're pay paid more. But then they realize, hey, we can replace uh, Mike with a 25-year-old, you know, who can also make up silly slogans, you know. And suddenly, I was cast out. And, and the sad thing also is, looking back on it, I had uh, I'd been so stupid about thinking that this company I was working for uh, was almost like a person. I mean, in other words, I thought of myself as dedicating 12-hour days and flying around a couple hundred thousand miles and really sacrificing for this company. But I didn't realize that I felt this loyalty and sacrifice, but a company doesn't care uh, about you as a person. And to, to think they do is a, is a huge mistake that I made. And I remember one Christmas, the kids were just, just Christmas Day was Christmas afternoon, and they were still sort of unwrapping and beginning to play with their toys. And I got a call, you have to do this commercial, TV commercial. And I left without even really thinking about it. And now I look back with real horror on that because, you know, the older I get, the more I realize those precious moments with your children or with your friends are, are evanescent. They're not going to come again. This is it for us. And to leave them in the midst of Christmas, how many Christmases do we have when your children are young and so eager and so full of wonder? To make a television commercial and treating it like it was life and death. And I was guilty as a boss. I got to be an executive VP and creative director of this big company. I was, I'd run down the hall on a Friday afternoon and say to people, we have to work the weekend. And I do this two or at least a twice a month. And you know, the 20 or 30 people I would bring in, if anyone said to me, but how about my family? Or I'd plan this, I'd look at them like, do you want to be fired? In other words, it was a culture of fear and, and a culture that was so twisted and all this time in meetings, more than 26 years, and I can't remember a single meeting, but I, I know I spent my time there. And that's a tragedy, looking back on it, or at least stupidity. And, you know, but the saddest thing is, I never would have left unless I hadn't been fired that day. It really hurt me that my loyalty was rewarded with no loyalty. You know, they didn't even explain that maybe that my salary was too high or bene whatever benefits, you know, it was. It was just fired within minutes after a lifetime of wrong priorities. And then I got divorced and I'd always counted on my family being there. You know how you just take for granted things. Now I thought of myself as being a good provider even though I wasn't home. I hadn't spent the time to build those things with my children and my wife, but I'd taken it for granted. And then so I was surprised. It sa sounds so sad, but surprised late in life, whoa. And then I went to my doctor Oh, here's another piece of advice. This was after I was 60. I went for a routine physical. Uh, there's no such thing after 60. Don't go. If someone says you should have a routine physical, you know, say no thank you. They're not going to find anything good. Just a question of what bad. But anyway, I went for a so-called routine physical and, uh, you know, I, then the doctor said, well, I, let's just check on something, have an MRI, and okay. But then it was a little longer. So when I went back to his office, I was a little scared and then he came towards me carrying my MRI photograph or whatever, and, but he had a smile on his face, a big smile. I thought, whoa, what a relief, you know, because how you, we all have those little moments in life we think, gosh, this could be it. And he was smiling, and I said, whoa, to myself, what a relief. But then he said, you have the rarest form of brain tumor. <laughs> but, you know, the greatest news, I'm a brain surgeon, and this is my specialty. I can operate tomorrow. And he actually went over to his desk and picked up some articles he'd written on this especially the brain tumor I had. I sort of stammered out, you know, I don't have any health insurance. And, and that slowed him down. It was like a stutter step, you know? <laughs> so here I was, you know, I'd, 
I'd taken for granted uh, that I'd always be rich and well rewarded and a famous, you know, I defined myself through who, what I, what I do, what I did. And uh, then I'd taken for granted my family and then my health. You, you, you just assume we're going to live forever, don't we? I mean, we get up each morning, well, we'll do that. We'll take the kids there. We'll, we'll do that thing. We'll see that friend. And we assume. And then it happens. Whoa. So one, more, one morning, I just was feeling so bad. I still got dressed up in my Brooks Brothers suit and my pretending like I was an ad executive, even years after it worked for me. But I went back to my old neighborhood. You know how sometimes you go back in your mind, or actually I went back physically to try to recapture that sense of a beloved, fortunate son. And I was in the Upper East Side in New York, and it didn't work, because I realized, gosh, you know, if, you know how you tell the story of your life? And my life was, I had everything, materially, intellectually, you know, the world cares about. Everything externally, if you looked at my life, you would have said, this man is living the American dream. And today, at, at 63, I was saying, I'd blown it. I lost it all. My life was over. And I was sort of looking for a hole to creep away and die in a way. And I looked over, and there was a new Starbucks store. Went inside and said, sort of like a condemned man, I said, at least I'm going to have one more latte. And, uh, but by accident. And this is where my life began to turn around. And you know how the greatest things in life happen by accident, not by our design. And I think if you're religious, you call it God's grace who intervenes on your side. That day I'd happened by accident to walk into a Starbucks store that was having a hiring event. And by accident, I happened to sit down next to this young African-American woman. And I didn't know it then, but she came from a totally different background. She'd grown up in Brooklyn in the projects, which are a very difficult area. Her mother had died of a drug overdose when she was 15. She'd been sent to an aunt who didn't like her. And she'd broken her hip, and she couldn't afford to uh, go to a hospital. So she, even as she sat there, she was in pain, uh, more pain than I was. But I didn't know any of that. Uh, she'd barely gotten out of high school. But because it was a hiring event, she looked over at me. And despite the fact I was all dressed up and you know, in, in my own world, she said, would you like a job? And you know, something about the way she said it, maybe, or, but once again, without thinking. If I'd thought about it, I would have said, no, I, I don't want to you know, trade my sense of entitlement and Brooks Brothers suit for a green apron serving people coffee, you know? That wasn't my, ever in my plans. But without thinking, and I think that's where, in a way, God's grace comes in again. Without thinking, I just said, yes. And then uh, Crystal said, that turned out to be her name, Crystal said, well, okay, here's a form, fill it out. But then I did another thing I, I had never done before. I said, I, I, I need help. And, you know, I never really asked for help. I never had needed to. But I knew I couldn't fill out that job application. Here I was at 63, I had never filled out a job application. But Crystal said, it's easy, okay, I'll help you. And that was a turning point, you know. We'd had a minority hiring program at J. Waller Thompson, you know, out of the goodness of our heart. We'd hired a lot of people from Harlem and other disadvantaged areas who didn't go to Yale or Ivy League schools. But we didn't believe they could make it. And you know, in that hiring program, and this was in the 80s, not one of them made it. And I remember myself, I'd stand, I was standing back from the person I'd been assigned. And her name was Jennifer. I said, well, you know, Jennifer's not going to make it. I didn't help her the way Crystal that day helped me. She said, oh, this is not hard. I'll, I'll do it with you. She sat down by my side. So I re already, I, I think, I realized this was something I had never done that was being done for me, undeserved grace in a sense. And she said, it's not very hard. Just let's start with the easiest question first. She said, uh, you know, do you have any retail experience? I said, well, what's retail? She said, well, you know, like Walmart. I said, well, I've never been in a Walmart. Ooh, I could tell, you know, I was being a loser. But I, I remember the terrible, you know, terrible, crazy slogan I'd done for Burger King once. I said, I, I work with Burger King. Oh, good, she said, that works. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Crystal put it down, and she was on my side. She was going to make it work for me. And then a couple weeks later, uh, oh, by the way, the other thing is she told me, she said, how many kids do you have? I said, I have five kids. Whoa, she said, you've been busy. <laughs> and she said, uh, you know, by the way, as a part-time employee, not only were your health needs to be covered, you know, and you'll get dental, and by the way, as a senior executive, we'd argue about whether we could afford dental, you know, and, and visual uh, things, even for top executives. She said, you'll be covered with all that, but plus, all your children will be covered, even as a part-time employee. So suddenly, I said, whoa, you know, it wasn't casual anymore. I realized I needed this job. So a couple weeks later, I was grateful when she called, and she said, okay, now meet me in my store on the west side, you know, 93rd and Broadway, and, you know, if you want, you want to work for me. 
And I said, 93rd and Broadway, I thought we met on the east side. The east side was my old neighborhood. I was scared to go to the west side. You know, the west side is where you meet some crazy people. I think every town has those kind of situations. She said, do you want to work for me or not? I could tell, you know, Crystal was going through like 20 names. So I, I said, yes, yes, I do. She said, oh, 8 o'clock in the morning, you know, tomorrow morning, and, you know, be ready to work. And I said, yeah, I will be there. And, you know, that night before, I was thinking, whoa, this is a job way below me. You know, in my elevated sense of myself with my educated background and all that stuff. But that morning when I showed up, I realized this, this is a job that could weigh beyond me. You know, I was really scared. I had to force my way in a line of, you know, eager New Yorkers. I just squeezed in and they were almost like, are you trying to get in line? Or, you know, I just squeezed in the door. And then I was really scared because I realized for the first time in my life, I would be the minority. Not only because most of the, you know, were African Americans, not only because uh, totally different educational background, but because I think most importantly, I was decades older. And they were calling out these drinks, you know, lattes, ventes, cappuccino, whoa. Language was is also sort of mysterious to me. So I stood there frozen because I really was scared. I mean, it was so terrifying to me that it's one thing to be fired from a major job, you know, you could sort of explain that, but then to go back to people and say, I, I was fired from Starbucks within seconds, right? But you know, Crystal saw me and she came over and she brought me to a table. She gave me a delicious coffee. I've always loved coffee. And she gave me an espresso brownie. And since I was a little boy, I've loved brownies. But you know, she was treating me with a kind of loving kindness and welcome that I'd never done for anyone else. In, in 26 years in J. Walter Thompson, I never even thought, it never entered my head to bring coffee for anyone who worked for me. She could see how scared I was. In other words, here's my new boss uh, serving me. And that was the world upside down. Again, I was already, I think, realizing that there's a whole different way to treat people than I had treated people. And then a, a guy came in the door, he was bigger than me, he was wearing what they call a do-rag, you know, in those things in the ears, and listening to music. And he was the kind of guy I would have, you know, walked across the street to avoid, right, in my previous life. And Crystal said, hey, Kester, come over and meet Mike. And uh, she said to me, uh, Mike, uh, Kester's going to be your training coach. Whoa, <laughs> you know, my training coach. But, you know, I was scared of Kester, but, but he wasn't scared of me. He just gave me a big smile and, you know, you know those people in life you meet who believe in you despite the evidence? Here I was an old person, you know, I, he wasn't the kind of person he's used to, you know, training, and he had no doubt I could do it. I mean, I remember, you know, dropping a thing of milk once, he said, everybody does that. Uh, but that first morning I knew that the cash registers of making drinks was beyond me, so I, uh, I luckily I heard Crystal tell Kester she had a cleaning problem. So I said to her, I'm the best cleaner in the world, you know? Whoa, by the way, I never had cleaned anything. I mean, my car, my office, my home, anything. But pretty soon I was down on the you know, hands and knees cleaning out this grout. She had a grout brush for the tiles. Then she took me over to the uh, bathroom. And uh, you know, today, I'm proud to say I can clean a bathroom. I can detail a bathroom like a Ferrari. I mean, it gleams. <laughs> One day I, was, I just cleaned the bathroom, and a homeless man came in. I could tell he was heading right for the bathroom. And I, I, I stepped in front of him because I just cleaned it. I didn't want him to ruin it, you know, for me. And, and, and uh, I, I said to him, you know, I'm sorry, the bathroom is out of order. Now, this homeless person didn't hesitate. He just turned around and left. He, you know, he was going to be rejected a dozen times like that. It was nothing new for him. But out of the corner of her eye, Crystal saw me do that. And she came right over and she said, I want to see you in my office. I could tell she was upset. And I said, it's no, no big thing. That was a mistake. She said, it is. She said, it is a big thing. She said, the last thing that gentleman, she called him a gentleman, the last thing that gentleman needed today was to be disrespected by you. And I, I understood what she meant. And then she said, just as I treat you with respect, you know, I expect you to treat everyone who walks in the door of our, our store with that same respect. Everyone who comes in that door is a welcome guest. And everyone can use any facilities and stay as long as they want. So I, re I realized that in a way my whole life had been a terrible uh, mistake that way. Because I'd, I'd spent my whole life categorizing people. Until I was 60, I'd ask people, where did you go to school? I, or what do you do? Because I wanted to make sure they were worthy of you know, association with me. It, it wasn't even conscious. It was just a, a, a series of questions I would put out right away. And judging him as a homeless person right away, right? It was back to the advertising guy who judges people on demographics, psychographics, rather than as individuals. 
And one of the great gifts that Crystal and Kester and everybody uh, every day gives me is that sense that it's so unimportant what background or education or any other aspect of life compared to the individual you meet that you have a chance to meet. Crystal found something for me to do. There's something called Coffee Master at Starbucks. You get to, you know, you, you learn about the coffee. She knew I loved coffee and he, I loved reading history. And, she's, she, and, and you can serve coffee to other people. You have coffee seminars. You talk about coffee with your guests. And that was perfect for me. So I could help her store by doing that role. So instead of trying to fit me into something she needed, she gave me something I could do that I needed. And that was another great lesson. Because in my previous career, I'd always just taken people and tried to use them were the way I needed them. And I remember one night closing with Kester, and it was, I'd mopped the floor and done everything right. It was about midnight, maybe 12.30. We went on the street afterwards, and Kester said, Mike, you did a good job cleaning the, you know, tonight, closing with me. I said, wow, that made me feel good. And then I looked up at the stars. It was about a year later since I joined them. And I put the hand, hand on my heart, and I said, you know, I'm happier. I'm happier than I've ever been. Where to happen to the high-status job, the big style life, the big house. And yet now, here I was in a very simple job, just serving other people and cleaning a, you know, toilets and doing, and I'm happier than I've ever been. So it was just like a, a, a revelation and a shock to me. And then I went back that night to my little apartment where I still live in, it's up three stories, it's got the uh, dining room table set is like a plastic picnic furniture, two picnic chairs, and you know, the whole set cost $53. But it's such a relief, I can't tell you. Such a relief to be without all that stuff. I don't know, it's like putting down a huge burden for me. The burden, may, I didn't even realize I was carrying, you know, it's so sad, I didn't realize I was trying to live up to expectations of my friends and family and my own expectations of what was important, the external markers of success. And by just putting it down, I felt so free. And that night I, I, I went to sleep, I felt like I was writing this this rising tide because I was sort of, I'd given up. I hadn't been the master of the universe. I'd proven that didn't work. And by giving up, by just letting the universe take charge or God take charge, suddenly I felt such a freedom, which I still feel today. I'm, as I talk to you now, I'm happier than I've ever been. And it's, it's a simple life. I get out of bed at 4 a.m. in the morning or creep out of bed at 68 and go over to open at 5 a.m. and serve coffee and share that laugh. But you know, those little moments are the moments that are most important in life. With friends, we talked about, if you think now, think back on your friends or your family. What are the moments? Are they the big, you know, expensive stuff or the titles your friends or you got? Or those little moments of laughter and love that you share? And I am I'm blessed to be able to share that today and every day because of sort of opening my eyes to this, this new way to live without all that stuff. And I, that's why I think Tom Hanks called and said he wanted to make a movie of my life. And that's really bizarre too, right? One minute I've written the thing, my life is over. And really shortly thereafter, Tom Hanks calls it, oh, your life is so inspiring, I want to make a movie out of it. You know, crazy and wonderful things happen, I think, when you give up that idea of you're in control. And you say, God is in control, not me. In the last year I've been going on this book tour, I've been told some of the lessons people have learned from my life. And that's the most important thing today, I think, is for everyone here, uh, to get something they can use right away in their lives. Because uh, I think that's why we share stories, right? That's why we write, that's why we talk to each other and, and share our stories and memoirs. Because we're trying to live better. And, and there is a gift of sharing that. So the, I call them the seven L's. And the, the first L is, is leap with faith, don't huddle in fear. You know, I was huddling in fear for years. I was in a box of my own constructing and I didn't know how to get out. And I thought so hard and went through so much agony and guilt and fear. And once I stopped and just said yes and leapt forward with faith, once you leap with faith, you can be helped. And when you're huddling in fear, you can't be, you're frozen. And it's hard for anybody to reach you, let alone God, you know? And then the second one is, the second L is, is, is to look with respect at every individual. Not in some abstract way, but everyone we see today. Even, even the people we we're never going to see again. Because in their eyes is a, is a mirror to their heart and to their soul. And you can be given. It's not, it's not because you're being great to do it. It's, you're being given so many gifts when you truly open your eyes. And the third L is listen to your heart. It's not anybody else's heart. And your desires and your 
path is different than anybody else's. And you know, until I was 60, I'd never listened to my own heart. I thought I must be happy because I was a you know, big earner doing this big job and, you know, and all those external measurements of success. But it's, that's not the road to happiness. Happiness is following your own heart, which is probably crazy a lot of times, so-called, but is the way to ha real happiness. Another one is lose your watch. Uh, I don't wear a watch anymore. Time is crazy in, in America today. I mean, anywhere in the world probably. Thousands of years ago, you know, we went by the sun, beautiful dawn today, right? I was out walking along you know, the Mississippi. I didn't wear a watch. I didn't want to be, you know, because I, if I wear a watch, I, I, I can't not check it, you know, constantly. So time, I think, is a tyr tyranny for us today, the way we're always in touch with it. And I did it with, my, I used to do that with my kids. I'd check my watch when I was playing crazy. I don't do that anymore, so lose your watch. And let go and let God is the other thing. Because I was trying so hard to be in charge, especially when things went bad. In a sad way, I redoubled my efforts versus just letting go and, and letting God come in, in, into my life. And the other thing is let your light shine forth. We're here today is celebrating books and reading and stories, storytelling. But everyone in this room has a story to tell that would help someone else to hear. So let your light shine forth and tell your story. Because every one of my partners I've discovered has more amazing stories than me. I was saying I thought my life is so tragic. It's nothing, nothing to what Crystal or other of my partners live every day. They have much bigger struggles and more dramatic victories. So everyone in this room has a story to tell. And you'll help your family and friends and the larger world if you share that story. Another one is just sort of let your voice be heard. I mean, in the Bible it says, in the beginning was the word. So let your voice be heard. It, it doesn't even have to be in a book. It can be in a conversation with a friend or with someone who needs help or someone you don't like very much. <laughs> and I think it can help us all to do that. And my wish actually, uh, you know, for all of us today uh, is to let ourselves create our own lives. God created us, and I think he called all of us to live unique and creatively different lives than our parents, friends, family, or anything done before in history. We have that within us. And we know we, know we are called to live those creative lives. So I would just urge everyone not to wait until my age to embark on that adventure of creative, creating a life that you love. And live every day uh, with love, another L. And finally, laugh. Laugh at yourself. You know, I, I lost the ability to just say, you are a stupid fool. <laughs> and just laugh at myself and relax. So give yourself the courage to live and create that great life. And that is, that is my, my, I would say, blessing and gift and hope for everyone, for all of us today. And uh, I'll just end on a joyful, uh, uh, a quick uh, phrase of a joyful song because the Bible also says, this is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. It doesn't say like it or get through it or make that appointment. It says, rejoice and be glad in it. And through joy comes through that creative act of living the way we're supposed to live and loving that. So, joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, echoing to thy love above. Thank you. Louisiana Book Talks is produced in cooperation with the Center for the Book in the State Library of Louisiana. And made possible in part by a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. This program is a production of Louisiana Public Broadcasting.